In this Warmaster video we're going to look at how hand-to-hand -hand combat works, especially the role of attacks, hits and armour. Enemy units that are in base contact with each other will fight in the combat phase. Combat will usually be initiated by one unit charging another. When it comes to making attacks against the enemy, both sides engaged in the fight will strike blows, regardless of whose turn it is. Where there are several combat engagements across the battlefield, the player whose turn it is selects the order in which the close combat engagements are worked out. However, once you've started to work out one combat engagement, you must complete that combat engagement as far as possible during that turn before you can move on to a new engagement. This includes both sides in the engagement striking blows, working out the winner, as well as any retreats, any pursuits, any fallbacks and any advances. We will discuss these concepts in greater detail, but for now it's important to understand that a unit which wins a combat engagement has the chance to affect another combat engagement during that turn. So this makes the order in which you choose to work out combat engagements very important, as a victorious unit can then lend its weight to support another combat in the same turn. If all goes well for you, you can set up a domino effect with your combat engagements. With each victory, you increase the chances of being able to positively influence any upcoming engagements. Whereas if you lose a combat engagement in your turn, the enemy has the chance to use their units to positively influence the outcome of any outstanding engagements. In other words, always pick the fights you are likely to win first. In the combat phase, both players will get to roll dice for their own units in that combat. The player whose turn it is gets to make their attacks first. Every stand of a unit that is touching an enemy stand can fight. It doesn't matter if the stands that are touching each other are touching face to face, edge to edge, side to side or corner to corner. Any contact at all means the stand is included in the combat and will fight. In this example we have several units from both sides engaged in one large combat engagement. This picture shows all the stands from Dogs of War units which can fight. And this picture shows all the stands from Undead units which can fight. So in the combat phase these stands will be fighting against each other. If a unit has at least one stand fighting in combat then the entire unit counts as engaged in combat. And this applies even if the only contact is corner to corner from one stand against an enemy. This is important because hits that are sustained in combat are applied to the entire unit, not on a stand by stand basis. And any stand which is fighting must direct all of its attacks against a single enemy unit in base contact. In other words, you're not allowed to divide up the attacks from any of your own stands against several enemy units. If there is a choice of enemy units in contact with one of your stands, you must declare which enemy unit you're going to attack before you roll the dice. There is also a strict order of priority which dictates how a stand that is fighting has to direct its own attacks against enemy stands in base contact. The first rule is that all stands must fight to their front wherever possible. In other words, your stands must fight the enemy that's in direct base-to-base -base contact with their front edge. If there is no unit in base contact with the front edge of your stands, then you must fight any enemy that are in edge-to-edge -edge contact with the sides or the rear of your stands. And finally, if there are no enemy stands in edge-to-edge -edge base contact with any of your stands, then you're allowed to fight corner to corner. Let's use this multiple combat as an example and see how individual stands will have to direct their attacks. We will start by looking at the left hand edge of the combat where the light cavalry is engaged with the rear of the chariots. The first stand of cavalry has one chariot stand directly in contact with its front edge so it must fight this stand. The second stand of cavalry only has corner to corner contact with a chariot stand so it also gets to fight against the same chariot stand. As only two stands of cavalry are in contact with the chariots, then only two stands will fight. 
Moving on to the chariot unit, we see that the middle stand of chariots does have an enemy infantry unit against its front edge, so it must fight this. The leftmost chariot stand has corner to corner contact with the same infantry unit, so it also must fight them. The right hand chariot stand has front corner to corner contact with the infantry, but rear edge to edge contact with the cavalry, so it must fight to the rear. So two chariot stands must direct their attacks at the infantry, and one chariot stand must direct its attacks at the cavalry. Next we'll look at the Dogs of War swordsmen in line formation. Two stands of swordsmen have skeleton warriors against their front edge, so they must fight them. One stand of swordsmen has skeleton warriors in its front corner, but chariots in its side edge, so it must fight the chariots. So in summary, two stands of swordsmen fight skeletons, one stand of swordsmen fight chariots. Next we move on to the skeleton warriors in line formation. They all have swordsmen straight in front of them so must direct their attacks forwards. But note that on the right hand side one stand of skeletons is attacking a different unit of swordsmen which is in column formation. If we move across to the swordsmen that are in column formation we have three separate units. Each unit has one stand fighting. They all have enemies to their front edge so they all fight straight forwards. On the left hand side the swordsmen are fighting skeleton warriors, whilst in the centre and on the right the swordsmen are fighting skeleton archers. Moving on to the skeleton archers in line formation, they all have stands directly in front of them. On the left and in the centre the skeleton archers must fight two different units of swordsmen, whilst on the right the skeleton archers are fighting knights across a wall. Note that enemy units fighting across a linear obstacle in this way project their front edge across the wall into contact with the enemy to work out who they have to fight. Always bear in mind however that the unit initiating combat by charging must be able to actually cross the obstacle in order to fight. So therefore chariots and artillery can never initiate a combat against a unit which is behind a wall. Moving on to the Bone Giant, he has front edge contact with two stands of knights from the same unit across the wall. He must direct all his attacks against one stand, he can't split them, but as they're from the same unit this doesn't matter. Moving on to the knights, the leftmost stand of knights has front edge contact with both the Bone Giant and a stand of skeleton archers. He can't split his attacks between the two separate units so must choose one of them to receive all his attacks. The same applies to the second stand of knights, which is in front edge contact with the bone giant and a stand of skeleton warriors, whilst the final stand of knights only has front edge contact with a stand of skeleton warriors, so must fight them. So in summary, two stands of knights must choose which way they are going to direct their attacks, whilst one stand must fight the skeletons. When we look at the skeleton warriors, they are in front edge contact with two stands of knights and one stand of marauders so they must choose to direct all their attacks against either the knights or the marauders. Looking at the marauders, they have front edge contact with a stand of skeletons and two stands of artillery. They will have to choose whether to direct all their attacks against the skeletons or the artillery. And finally the artillery only has marauders touching their front edge, so they will direct all their attacks against the marauders. Once you've worked out against which enemy unit you're going to make your attacks, you need to roll them. To make attacks in close combat you must refer to your unit's attack value. You can find a unit's attack value under the attack column of your army list. Where a unit has two numbers divided by a slash in the attack column, it is always the first number that is relevant for close combat. The attack number simply means the number of dice that each stand in the attacking unit will roll. Next you need to apply any attack modifiers. Page 41 of the rulebook lists all the attack modifiers used in close combat. Each of these modifiers will apply to every stand that is fighting. Let's look at the first one, charging an enemy in the open. We discussed enemies who are defended, fortified or in the open in the shooting video and the same applies for close combat. Unless you are fighting infantry or artillery that is in a defended or fortified position, you will always get the charge bonus. This is a big incentive to engage in close combat, as the charging unit will almost always increase the number of dice it rolls. 
Let's see how this works. In this example the Dogs of War units have charged into combat with the Undead units. Moving left to right we have a unit of Knights charging chariots on a hill, a unit of Light Cavalry charging artillery on a hill, a unit of Swordsmen charging skeletons in the open and a unit of Swordsmen charging skeletons behind a wall. Page 41 of the rule book clarifies when you apply the charge bonus. The Knights do get their charge bonus as they're fighting chariots and it doesn't matter that the chariots are on a hill. Chariots can never claim defended status so they always count in the open. The Light Cavalry don't get their charge bonus as they're fighting artillery which is higher up the hill than them and therefore in a defended position. The left hand swordsmen do get their charge bonus as they're fighting skeleton warriors in the open. But the right hand swordsmen don't get their charge bonus as they're fighting skeleton warriors behind a wall and therefore in a defended position. Remember it's only ever artillery or infantry that can claim defended or fortified status. Every other unit type always counts as in the open and will always grant you your charge bonus. A monster or chariot unit which charges an enemy in the open gains an additional bonus attack when they charge so they'll get plus two attacks per stand instead of the normal plus one. So in this example we have undead chariots charging cavalry on a hill, the bone giant charging infantry on a hill and the sphinx charging infantry in the open. Again page 41 of the rulebook clarifies when monsters or chariots get their charge bonus. The chariots do as the cavalry are in the open whilst the bone giant does not as the infantry are defended. Meanwhile the Sphinx does as the infantry are in the open. The next two bonuses to attack modifiers apply only when a unit is pursuing and we will deal with this later on. The bottom three attack modifiers on page 41 of the rulebook deal with negative modifiers to a unit's attacks value. The first of these is Terror. You suffer minus one attack per stand when fighting a terrifying enemy. So let's see how this works. On the left we have Dogs of War Cavalry fighting a terrifying Bone Giant and on the right we have Dogs of War Infantry fighting a terrifying Sphinx and some non-terrifying Skeletons. Page 41 of the rulebook clarifies that stands are affected by terror if they're merely touching a terrifying enemy. So all three Cavalry stands are affected by terror even though two of them are only touching corner to corner against the Bone Giant while the infantry only have one stand touching the Sphinx, so only one stand is terrified. If we were to add a terror causing character to the skeleton unit, such as this zombie dragon, ridden by a priest, then the entire unit joined by the terrifying character counts as causing terror. This means that all the Dogs of War infantry stands are now touching a terrifying enemy and all of them will lose one attack from terror. However, enemies that cause terror cannot themselves be subject to terror. In other words, you cannot terrify a terror-causing unit. So if we add a terror-causing character to the unit of swordsmen, they all count as causing terror themselves and will be immune to the terror-causing undead units. Negative attack modifier. The next attack modifier that reduces attacks is when the enemy is facing your own stands side or rear. Here we have an unfortunate skeleton unit which is engaged both in the front, in the flank and in the rear by Dogs of War units. Page 41 of the rulebook clarifies that if you have any enemy stands touching your rear or side edge you will lose one attack. As all three skeleton stands have an enemy unit either touching their side edge or their rear edge they all lose one attack. Note that this negative modifier is only ever applied once to a stand no matter how many enemy stands are touching its flank or rear. So this skeleton stand still only loses one attack even though it has three enemy stands in its flank and one enemy stand in its rear. Moving on to a different example we see that page 41 of the rulebook clarifies that the minus one attack penalty for enemy in the flank or rear will apply even where it's only corner to corner contact from an enemy's front edge into your rear or side edge. 
So here we have two stands from two different units of Dogs of War infantry and one of them has the Sphinx in its side edge and one of them has the Sphinx touching corner to corner against its rear corner. This is enough to apply the minus one attack penalty for enemy in flank or rear to both stands. The minus one attack penalty for enemy in flank or rear does not apply however if the enemy is not touching your stand's flank or rear with their front edge or front corner. Here we can see a skeleton stand and a swordsman stand touching side to side. Even though both stands have an enemy touching their flank, because they don't have an enemy front edge touching their flank, the penalty doesn't apply. Another way to look at it is, if the only contact between enemy stands is flank to flank or even rear to rear, this is not sufficient to impose the penalty. The final attack modifier is when a stand is confused. We will discuss confusion in greater detail in a later video. But it's enough to know that the status of confusion will apply to all stands in a unit. Although different attack modifiers will only apply to stands in combat once, the total number of attack modifiers that apply to a stand are cumulative. So for example, individual stands may have their number of attacks increased when they charge, but also decreased if they charge into combat with a terrifying enemy, or if other enemies appear in their flank or rear, or they become confused. In this example, the knights have charged in against the Sphinx. They all get plus one attack per stand for charging, but then they lose one attack per stand as the Sphinx is terrifying. So each knight stand will fight in the upcoming combat with their basic number of attacks. In this example the bone giant has charged into the flank of two swordsmen units. In the rearmost unit the stand touching the bone giant loses one attack for terror and one attack for being flanked. So that stand reduces its attacks by two. The front unit is also confused, so the stand fighting the bone giant loses one attack for being flanked in the rear corner, one attack for being terrified, and one attack for being confused. This reduces the stand's attacks by three. Because swordsmen only have three attacks, this would normally mean that the stand cannot fight at all, as three minus three is zero, and if you have zero attacks, you can't make any. However, the rules do permit even a unit reduced to zero attacks to throw at least one dice in the combat. This is called the last ditch dice. But this last ditch dice represents the entire unit's attacks, not the attacks of any individual stand. So even if you have three stands in combat and your attacks have been reduced to zero, you still only get to roll one dice. So once you've established how many attacks each of your stands in combat can make, and also against which enemy unit those attacks will be made, all that is left to do is to work out the required roll to hit. Page 42 of the rulebook tells us that the basic score on a d6 required to hit the enemy in close combat is a 4, 5 or 6. If the enemy is in a defended position, then your chance to hit is reduced to a 5 or 6, and if the enemy is in a fortified position, the chance to hit is reduced to a 6. Remember, in combat it's only infantry or artillery that can claim defended or fortified status. If a unit has moved in any way that turn, such as charging into combat, or retreating, or pursuing, then it can't claim defended status. Here we have some examples of where infantry will most commonly be defended by the terrain they occupy higher on the slope of a hill than the enemy, in broken or marshy ground, behind a linear obstacle, or inside a wood. So when charging into combat with enemies defended in this way, you will lose your charge bonus and require a 5 to hit them. Fortified enemies will be those that occupy the ramparts of a castle wall. Only infantry units, flyers, or giants can move into base contact and attack enemy that are fortified in this way, and any attacking unit will lose their charge bonus and require a 6 to hit the fortified troops. Before you actually roll any dice to attack in close combat, it is good sportsmanship to take a moment to discuss with your opponent where your attacks are being allocated, how many dice you intend to roll, and what the score is you need to hit. 
This helps to reduce any confusion and may prevent any disagreements later on. This is also important because when you roll attack dice you must roll all the attack dice for every stand in a unit at the same time. You're not allowed to wait and see how your first stand does before you decide where you're going to allocate the attacks of a second stand or a third stand. The player whose turn it is always gets to make their attacks first and then the opponent fights back. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference in what order units engaged in the same combat actually make their attacks as both sides will still get to attack before any casualties are removed. So let's see how this plays out on the battlefield. In this example, a unit of Dogs of War swordsmen in line formation has charged into a unit of skeleton warriors also in line formation. This is a very straightforward combat as both units fighting have all their stands in front edge to edge contact with each other. The Dogs of War swordsmen have attack 3. As they are charging the skeletons in the open, each swordsman stand gets plus 1 attack. So the total number of attack dice that the swordsman will roll against the skeletons is 12. Meanwhile the skeleton warriors have attack 2 and they have no charge bonus. So the total number of attack dice that the skeletons will roll against the swordsman is 6. When two units charge each other in the open then calculating the number of attack dice is often this simple. But when dealing with a more complicated combat it is worth double checking that you have the number of attacks correct. In this example the chariots are already in combat with the swordsmen and they've been charged by the cavalry in the rear. Chariots normally have three attacks per stand but the cavalry to their rear reduces that from a three to a two for two of the chariot stands. We've already established the direction in which the chariots must make their attacks. So in total the chariots will make five attacks hitting on a four plus against the swordsmen and two attacks hitting on a four plus against the cavalry. In this example the swordsmen are fighting skeletons to their front and chariots in the flank. Swordsmen normally have three attacks but one stand loses an attack due to the chariot flanking it. Again we already know the direction in which the swordsmen must make their attacks. So the skeletons will take six attacks and the chariots will take two attacks from the swordsmen. All hitting on a four plus. In this example the knights have charged into contact with the bone giant and two units of infantry which are defended behind a wall. Knights normally have three attacks per stand but the bone giant causes terror so we'll reduce this from three to two. But the knights do have a choice as to which way they direct their attacks and this will have a big impact on the number of attacks they make and what their score to hit will be. If the left hand stand of knights chooses to attack the skeleton archers behind the wall then they will only roll two attack dice requiring five plus to hit. This is because defended status cancels the charge bonus of the knights and forces them to roll 5 plus to hit, whilst the terror from the bone giant reduces their base attacks from 3 to 2. If the left hand stand of knights wishes to attack the bone giant then they will get to make 3 attacks. This is because the bone giant cannot claim defended status so the knights will gain their charge bonus, but then their attacks are reduced from 4 back to 3 by the terror of the bone giant. The central stand of knights also has exactly the same choice to make. If they choose to attack the skeleton warriors over the wall they can make a maximum of two attacks requiring a five to hit but if they also attack the bone giant they can make a maximum of three attacks requiring a four to hit. Finally the right hand stand of knights can only attack the skeletons behind the wall so they won't get a charge bonus and do require a five plus to hit but they're not terrified by the bone giant so they get their basic three attacks. So in summary the skeleton archers will either take no attacks or two attacks hitting on a five plus. The bone giant will either take no attacks, three attacks or six attacks hitting on a four plus. And the skeleton warriors behind the wall will either take three attacks or five attacks hitting on a five plus. The final example is the unit of skeleton warriors in column behind the wall. They have been charged by both the marauders and the knights. The skeletons can make two basic attacks and must choose to send them both at the knights or both at the marauders. Regardless of who receives the skeletons attacks they will both hit on a 4 plus.
But this is because neither the knights nor the marauders may claim defended status. The knights because they are cavalry and the marauders because they charged this turn. Hopefully this example has shown you why it is important to discuss with your opponent where you're going to make your attacks and what score you need to hit before you roll the dice. But let us now return to some simpler examples and see how attacks, hits and armour work. Here we have our three stands of Dogs of War Swordsmen fighting three stands of Skeleton Warriors. The swordsmen will be making 12 attacks against the skeleton warriors 6 attacks. The swordsmen go first and roll their 12 attack dice requiring 4 plus to hit as the skeletons are in the open. They score 7 hits. Before these 7 hits are applied to the unit, the skeleton warriors get a chance to negate each hit by passing an armour save. Skeleton warriors have an armour save of 6 plus, so for each hit that the swordsmen have caused, the skeletons roll one dice and will negate each hit on the roll of a six. The skeletons roll seven dice and score two sixes, so they've negated two of the seven hits. Seven minus two is five, so we record that the skeletons have suffered five hits in this round of combat. The skeletons now make their six attacks back against the swordsmen. They also need a four plus to hit and score three hits. The swordsmen may now try and negate these three hits by passing their armour save of 6+. They roll three dice but fail to roll any sixes, so they have sustained three hits. We record the three hits sustained against the swordsman unit. The first round of combat is now complete. Next we determine the winner. If one side completely wipes the other side out, then they are the winner. A unit will be wiped out in combat if it sustains a number of hits equal to the total number of hits left in the unit. A unit's hits value can be found by looking at their army list entry. In this example both units have hits 3. This means that each stand in the unit can sustain up to 3 hits before it is removed as a casualty. In this combat round both units have 3 stands so the total number of hits each unit can sustain is 9. Neither unit has inflicted 9 hits on the other so neither unit has wiped the other out. It's important to realise that you can't inflict more hits on a unit than the unit has remaining. So in this example, even if the swordsman had landed all 12 hits and the skeletons had failed to save all 12 hits, the skeletons would still only sustain 9 hits, as that's all they have to give. In a combat where neither side wipes the other out, you use the total number of hits inflicted to determine the winner. In this case, the swordsmen inflicted 5 hits and the skeletons inflicted 3 hits, so the swordsmen win. We now need to remove casualties from both sides. Because the skeletons lost the combat, they remove casualties first. Each stand of skeletons can sustain up to 3 hits before it's removed as a casualty. 5 hits inflicted is enough to remove one stand of skeletons with 2 hits carried over. The owning player always chooses which of their stands to remove. You can choose any stand in the unit to remove as a casualty. It doesn't have to be any of the stands which were actually fighting or even in contact with the enemy. The only restriction on casualty removal is that you can't remove a stand if this would break the unit's formation. So in this case the skeletons cannot remove the centre stand and leave two stands on their own. In this example, the undead player removes the rightmost stand of skeletons. The Dogs of War player then takes their turn to remove their casualties. Their unit has sustained three hits, so must remove one stand. They choose the leftmost stand. Once all casualties have been removed, the losing side will retreat from combat. The winning side then gets to choose whether they wish to pursue the retreating enemy, or hold their ground, or fall back. Retreating, pursuing and falling back will be discussed in the next video. However, there is one more topic that I wish to discuss before we finish, and that is the role of infantry support. Infantry units in combat may call upon support from friendly infantry stands that didn't fight in the combat but are adjacent to fighting stands. Where an infantry unit does call on support in this way, then the total number of supporting stands is added to the number of hits that the unit caused in combat 
to increase your side's total score. Let's see how this works. In this example we have four units of Dogs of War swordsmen all in line formation fighting against four units of skeletons. This diagram shows how the four Dogs of War infantry units are arranged. The top left unit has all its stands engaged in combat with skeletons and the top right unit has one stand engaged. An infantry stand is allowed to support another infantry stand which is fighting to its front. In order to provide support, an infantry stand must be aligned directly behind or directly beside another friendly infantry stand which fought in the combat. The supporting stand must be in edge-to-edge -edge contact and must be facing the same way as the stand it wishes to support. In order to provide support, a stand must not be fighting the enemy itself and must not be confused. So in our example, all of the stands marked in green will support the stands that are fighting marked in red. It doesn't matter whether the supporting stands are from the same unit that is fighting or from a separate unit, they still provide support. Support is not an optional rule. If a stand can support, it must support. So in this combat, the Dogs of War units will get to add 5 to their combat total, thanks to the supporting stands. Note that support is separate to hits. Increasing your score by support does not actually increase the number of hits you inflict on the enemy units. Support is merely a mechanism that allows infantry units to boost their score in combat and allow them to compete against stronger opponents. If we look at the undead units we see that they also have four units fighting and they also can call upon five supporting stands to boost their combat score by five. In this example the Dogs of War infantry units have been charged in the flank by the undead chariots. The two stands that are fighting the chariots cannot claim any infantry support and this is because both fighting stands are fighting to their flank. Remember you can only claim infantry support if you fought to your front. So what happens if you're fighting to your front and to your flank? The rules do allow an infantry stand which is fighting to its front and to its flank to claim infantry support. In this example the top right stand of swordsmen is fighting chariots to the front and a bone giant to the flank. Due to the terrain feature the bone giant cannot make full edge to edge contact with the side of the stand and this in turn means the bone giant is not in corner to corner contact with the infantry stand directly behind the one that is fighting. This means that the bottom right stand is eligible to provide infantry support, along with two other stands in the combat. In this example we have two units of swordsmen in line formation fighting chariots. However the rearmost unit of swordsmen is confused. Confused stands cannot provide support. Therefore the only supporting stand is the top left one. This concludes the video on how attacks, hits and armour work in close combat. As always if there is anything in this video which you find unclear or if you feel that I've got wrong please let me know in the comments below. In the next video we're going to explore combat results. We will discuss how retreats, pursuits, fallbacks and advances work. In the meantime, happy gaming and may your attack dice always roll high.